Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I've enjoyed this meeting so far. And we're going to now talk about a different thing with water safety. Dr. Schneider talked about ozone and also the model of injecting a rat and assessing its risk. You've heard this, but how do you assess the risk that these products pose to humans? So we're going to piggyback, and these are just my funding sources, disclosures and all that. That's all there. Notice it seems very different, but believe it or not, all these are actually linked. You have to learn to leverage in academia. Water disinfection. It's another way that we go about making the water supply safety for consumption. And we have to do this. As Dr. Schneider pointed out, there are some pretty bad bugs in that water and we don't want to ingest them. And water disinfection in the United States alone is protecting, this was 260, it's probably up by then. What you're doing here is you're oxidizing organic elements, as just talked about, and that oxidation essentially kills it. But it also produces byproducts. And if you take a look down there, these are called DPBs, disinfection byproducts. And if you use chlorination, which is really good at killing these bugs, you get trihalomethanes, haloacetic acid, other things. So what about chlorine dioxide? Well, you get that. What about chloramine? You get chlorate. And ozone, which we'll talk about, turns bromide, which is present in drinking water at like very high levels, pretty inert. The joke is you only hurt your cells if you drop it, the, you know, the bag onto the cells, um, produces bromate. So in some regards, you're changing one thing for another. We don't know what the risk of these are, and that's what we're going to talk about. I'm going to do this as a case study looking at bromate, which is right there. This is a produced because of ozonation. Now, ozonation is not really used a lot in the United States. It is in Europe and Asia. Dubai, Singapore is one of the places, actually, we're trying to do this. And what happens is the bromide goes to bromate. Well, bromate is a probable human carcinogen by IARC. It actually targets the kidney. And the EPA, we're kind of going from where Dr. Schneider was, has actually looked, looked at all the data out there and has determined that its maximum containment level, which you just heard about, is 0.01 parts per million or 10 parts per billion. And again, this, as Dr. Schneider pointed out, is not necessarily the safest level. This is a cost-benefit analysis. And this is actually based, if you see there in red, on the um, cancer oral slope that, because you start to see renal effects. Urothelial hyperplasia. And you see that at a point of departure, which is the lowest one that they see, at one point meg per kg, or one part per million per day. And there's your uncertainty factor. We're going to come back and visit this, because this is based on those experiments that Dr. Schneider talked about, about actually injecting rats, or actually you're exposing them, in this case, to drinking water, and then seeing what happens. Very slow process. And I want to point out that that 10 parts per uh, million, or I'm sorry, 10 parts per billion, very hard to detect. There's only a few analytical chemists I know that can do it consistently, and Dr. Schneider's actually one of them. He also published, I believe, a paper a couple of years ago saying in drinking water it was as high as, what, 60 parts per billion? And that's in bottled water, by the way, so. Now, I'm going to shift gears. We have the standard urothelial hyperplasia, which is a pathological type of reference, very important. But the big question there's a lot of questions in the EPA. It's how do we include some of these other things coming out, especially as a toxicologist? We heard about epigenetics. I'm going to take you a little bit through this. This is a definition up there. There's a lot of different things, including methylation, histone modification, microRNAs. All this occurs in the absence of any mutations or genotoxicity. We know this is important in the genesis of cancer. But how do water disinfection byproducts alter these? And more importantly, how should we use that in assessing the risk? This is just a couple of pictures. It's just demonstrating what these are if you're not familiar with it. This is an example of acetylation. Get my little pointer here. I'm limited in life by my ability to draw. So basically, you have your histone. It's in an octomer. It's happy. It's wrapping up the DNA. And DNA that's wrapped up in a cozy little blanket doesn't want to be transcribed. It's happy. So if you go on in, and you have these enzymes that put these little yellow groups on there, acetylation, it causes change in conformation. That DNA begins to unwind. Now the DNA is open, and it can be transcribed more easier, and you see an increase in transcription. And you have enzymes which help to do this, histone deacetylases, and 
Actually, histone acetylases is your on signal. For every on signal, you have an off signal, and this would be histone deacetylases. And then you have DNA methyltransferases, and these guys add methyl groups to your DNA, and by doing that, makes them inaccessible to transcription factors, and then that DNA is not going to be transcribed. And then you have DNA methyltransferases. It goes both ways. These are two examples of epigenetic events that we're going to use with a case study with bromate. Now, we have really nice inhibitors of these, and these inhibitors had been originally identified as possible anti-cancer treatments because, again, these changes in epigenetics occur a lot in cancer cases. In my other life, I'm also a pros the other side of my life, I study prostate cancer, and so we kind of look at changes in prostate cancer, and then we look at changes in kidney as well. So there's some nice inhibitors of these, such as trichostatin A, which is shown in red here, and then for DNA methyltransferase, and we can use 5-azacytidine, which is shown here. Just pharmacological tools originally developed in the pharmaceutical industry that didn't go anywhere in clinical trials, but are really useful for the study of cell death mechanisms and things. Now, we're going to focus on a specific protein in our case study here, P21. It's a cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitor that plays an important role in regulating the cell cycle. The expression of this gene is controlled by P53, which we know is a prominent gene which is knocked out in many cancers. However, it can also be controlled in P53 independent mechanisms. And whenever you see P21 being activated in the absence of P53, that is a sign of a number of cancers, including prostate cancer. So we did some studies. I'm sorry, this is just demonstrating where it plays a role in mediating your cell cycle and it belongs to this family of called cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitors. We did some studies and looking at the effects of bromate on P21, and I'm going to summarize a lot of work here. I worked with Dr. Schneider for a number of years measuring uh, bromate in rats exposed to bromide and bromate, measuring gene induction. I've done cDNA ray transcriptomics, next generation sequencing, looked at all these markers, and basically P21 came up, and I was always trying to get away from it because, and I'm ashamed to say, because people, oh, P21, we know what that does. It's, it's an old gene. Well, we weren't finding any new genes, and I know that's easier to get your papers published because it's novel and new, but sometimes you got to go where the science takes you, and it kept on coming back to this guy. So finally I gave in, and I said, fine. <laughs> So we demonstrated that the high doses that Dr. Schneider talked about that may not be relevant induces DNA damage in 8-hydroxyoxyguanosine. This is the marker that they use in some of the cancer studies for bromate. We know it induces cell death in human and rat kidney cells. We also know that we get this inhibition, and as I'm showing in this paper, of, D of um, inhibiting DNA methylation and histone deacetylation altered P21. So this bring up the idea that, yeah, bromate induces P21. Now, this kind of scares me for a bit. I don't know what people might do if they get a hold of this in the regulation world, and I'll come back to that. So I'm summarizing a lot of studies. We knew it was reckoning um, bromate induced this, but we didn't know the mechanisms. So these are the questions, and this is what came up. Should then we use epigenetics to assess the safety of disinfection byproducts? I'll come back to that. And then, what's the difference between rats and humans? Randy Yertle, who coined the Goody Sisters and is one of, considered one of the fathers, talked about how we've been curing cancer in mice for years. Doesn't translate to humans, and his theory is it's because the epigenetics are not the same. And I'll talk about that with P20 as a case sample. And finally, the big, what does this mean for risk assessment? Dr. Schneider mentioned acute studies. Those do work, and a lot of times you will see toxicologists, well, not just toxicologists, people dose cells in animals with highly acute doses, uh, highly toxic acutely, and publish those and say, we get this epigenetic change. That may have nothing to do with real-life scenario. So taking lessons we learned from the arsenic field, we kind of developed a study in cells and where we're doing subchronic dosing. We hit these guys up once, and we use a range. I want to point out that we're 10 times below the MCL in exposing these cells. You uh, hit them again and again. You collect these for next generation sequencing and uh, chip assays. 
And each time you do it, you're tracking what happens with each subsequent exposure. Now, the nice things about doing this in vitro is because we're looking at epigenetic changes in the DNA. In the DNA from a kidney cell, a P21 isn't really going to be that different than a DNA in um, a cell isolated from in vivo. But we have did the in vivo work as well. So we're just trying to pinpoint those epigenetic mechanisms before we go back into in vivo studies. We're up to dose six now. This takes a long time. My graduate student, it takes her about six months to get N01. <laughs> and it's important that I show this slide because we don't want cell death. I've seen too many papers out there where people are reporting epigenetic changes and the cells are dying. Yeah, of course your methylation of DNA is going to go down if your cell's dying. So we actually had to demonstrate, which is almost impossible, that the absence of cell death. Luckily, I've done a lot of work with this, and this is just dosing. These pictures may not be showing up, but to see it as believe it is, these cells are growing. 10 parts per billion, 100 parts per billion, 10. And if you look at the growth curves down in G here, you can see that at 10 parts per billion, you begin to get cytostasis, and at 50, they're going. All those toxicity acute studies that talk about urothelial hyperplasia is done at way doses higher. We're looking here, I can't find DNA damage, I can't find 8-hydroxydeoxyguanosine, I can't find a number of things. These cells are not dying, and I'm pretty sure of that. So doing this, we took a look now at P21. I'm going to go through this data quickly because it's published. This is the first dose, the second dose, the third dose, we go all the way up to 18. If you take a look at P21 right here, and this is an amino blot, you see that you're getting an increase in P21 expression at 10 parts per billion, which is the MCL. Granted, it is in cells. We're not seeing too many changes in P53. In fact, if anything, the phosphorylation at this point is going down while P21 goes up, and P38 is another marker. Now, if you take a look at 10, you start to see a decrease, and we'll come back to this. So as we go higher, what we saw was almost like a roller coaster. At lower doses, we had expression of P21, but as we got higher to cytotoxic, it actually went away. In case you aren't a fan of cell culture, and this is data from an in vivo study, and this again is published, and this is just your amino histo. The brown demonstrates an increase in staining. I know this one's a high dose, but we went as low as 12.5 mg per kg of bromate and still saw it. We just did this study. I haven't gone lower yet, but it does happen in vivo. We do see a difference between male and female as well. So yes, it happens in vivo. If we actually treat with bromate, and that's what I'm showing in this, we see an increase in P21. If we inhibit DNA methyltransferases, it goes down. If we inhibit HDAX, it also goes down or acetylation. Now, granted, this is an acute study, but this was our evidence that leads me up to my first summary. Bromate increases the expression of P21. You got to buy that for this case study. If you don't, I'll have to try to convince you. Now, these occurred at doses in vitro as low as the MCL, so we were pretty excited about that. So the molecular biologist in me was excited. The toxicologist in me said, whoa, pump the brakes, son. Now, we have data that it was actually altered by P21, but we didn't know the mechanism. And we didn't know if it was epigenetics, what exactly was it. And furthermore, we didn't know the difference between rats and humans. So we did this doing standard approaches, but one of the problems is to look at DNA methylation is very laborious the way that we were doing it. You're actually doing methylation-specific PCR by sulfite conversion, cloning that product into a plasmid, growing that plasmid, and doing Langer sequencing, and then comparing it. It would take months to maybe get an N of six or seven, and then you actually weren't getting as high-end uh, accuracy as we'd like. So we needed a better way to do this. So what we did is we came up with this method called targeted by sulfite next-generation sequencing. And we told the genomics people what we wanted to do. They're like, what? And then we looked at the computer stuff or the actual programs. They, were, they didn't exist. So we actually had to write our own programs, create our own databases to do this. And I'm happy to share that information in through. So we do the same thing, grow the cells, expose them. We can extract the DNA and convert it. And this is going to basically tell your changes in methylation. And we have to target this. We're looking at a specific site. This is different than just whole next generation sequencing where you're generating data. 
I already know my target. I've already did the cDNA arrays, all this. Kept on bringing us back here. We actually now know the specific gene or one of them that's being targeted. We elute, we normalize, and we tagged it to get it ready for Illumina sequencing in next generation with specific primers. We pulled it, and then we did next generation sequencing. What this allowed us to do, as opposed to getting maybe one or three clones, we can now look at 30,000 sequences of the same gene. That is deep sequencing. It improved our accuracy and our statistics. Now, to do this, we had to create our own reference genome folder. We actually had to look at all the gene sequences published for P21 for the rat as well as the human. Put that in and then write programs to allow us to compare, convert the genome, to every possible methylation product that could exist, align it, and this is where we had to write our own code, extract the data, and this is some of what the raw data looks like, and then actually come up with a way to present that. And this is what we're doing so far. So what you have here, and just the top for comparison, are human P21 promoter region. This is the rat coding region that we had actually published before using the laborious way. The uh, lighter red colors represent decreased methylation and the blue colors represent high methylation. Here we have just our different groups and what you have here are just different sites along the gene sequence in the upstream promoter sequence. So these are the actual sites that are methylated or not. Before we could even look at the effect of a toxicant on methylation, we had to know what the basal methylation was and that wasn't even known. So if you're gonna compare the effect of a toxin or environmental hazard on epigenetic changes, you have to know what the base situation is. And it's not always gonna be the same. These genes aren't always gonna show up that this site is always gonna be methylated or not. It's a percentage. And so what this is demonstrating is sites along this gene that these had various, and this was the effect of different controls. We started out with 5-ASA and cisplatin as a positive control. But if you kind of look, there's differences. And if you look at the rat promoter, the rat coding region, which we had published before, the site that was really different with treatment with bromate was at 152, and we hadn't been able to know that before. So now we've actually identified a site whose methylation is altered with bromate. A lot of work I'm summarizing here, but we looked at the coding region for both rat and human. We looked at the promoter region. We, this is your start site at plus one. And if you take a look, the first thing I'm going to tell you is that for at least rat and human, the coding sequence is very similar. The non-coding sequence, the one upstream, where these epigenetic changes would be occurring are completely different. It's apples and oranges. That's without exposure. We have this transcription start site and we have almost tenfold higher methylation in the rat genome than the human. And then we found this novel site in human called S1E1 that is known to be altered in many cancers that's in just a normal human P21. The rat doesn't have it. Right, or I, right away telling you that methylation control is gonna be different in between these two. And then the coding region, I'm not showing it for you, the human, but it's highly methylated in rat. This is again demonstrating that there are changes in the rat and there are differences in the rat and human genome for P21 and assessing the effect of bromate on those changes is apples to oranges comparison. This is a lot of work. We looked at human P21 region. We're exposing it to water and bromate up at very low levels, one part per billion, 10 and our positive control is 5-ASA, and we identified the specific sites within the DNA that would be changed at least with 5-ASA. And I'm gonna tell you right now, regardless of our method, we didn't see a change in methylation at all. We did with 5-ASA. It's a little bit easier to look at with this slide. This is the specific base site, 34, 74, 236, just represents base pairs upstream. And this is DMSO. And you can see that 5-ASA does decrease it, and this is a lot of reads, so these are statistically uh, different, but bromate didn't do anything. So bromate-induced changes in P21 in rats and humans probably aren't because of methylation. So if it's not that, what is it? So that was a lot of work by my graduate student for data that was essentially negative to her, but I felt it was really good because we identified key sites of methylation. 
This is just our method for the chip assay. It's pretty standard, nothing really new there. Again, what we're measuring is the change in acetylation of histones, and an increase in acetylation will be an increase in gene transcription. And if you take a look at control here and relative acetylation of this specific histone, identifying it, you can see that levels tenfold below the MCL and at the MCL are increasing. Um, sorry, I need to go back. This is day dose one, so just three days. We get about a twofold increase, not too bad. If you do it again, now we start to see a threefold increase, and this is our six days of exposure, subchronic. But notice what happens at a higher toxic dose, it goes down. Another lesson to walk away from. Just because you get an epigenetic change at one dose doesn't mean you're going to see that change even at a higher dose. It is not linear. You cannot assume that acute uh, responses at toxic doses are going to be mimicked at lower doses. It is not linear, and that's important in risk assessment. So this decrease at 10 and 100 actually mimics what we saw in the actual protein expression. Again, to wrap this up, we did, right now we're up to 18 straight days, and obviously we can't go with 100, we're still at 10, and we kind of see the same thing, and I'm doing this to address another question in epigenetics and risk assessment, persistence of that change. Does it get worse? We know that there are studies where animals exposed to gene, to drugs, toxins in utero get an epigenetic change that is still present when they hit puberty and that can manifest in ovarian tumors. We know this in human populations as well, but is it persistent? Will it change? And so right now what we're doing is we're with the, we get enough where we get this change and then we're withdrawing the drug. How long? So in summary here, bromate does increase the acetylation of histone in P21. Does it in renal cells after a bulk, acute and chronic? These occurred at low doses, environmentally relevant doses. And we know the mechanism of, reg, uh, the mechanism of action, it's histone acetylation. That's what I said here. So the, I'm a molecular toxicologist. So from a molecular standpoint, I said, I'm, this is exciting. We're identifying the specific DNA bases altered by a toxicant. But the toxicologist in me is like, whoa, are these even relevant? What does it mean for risk assessment? Now, we know that increases in P21 in the kidney is actually protective against ischemia or perfusion in cisplatin. So these changes may not be an adverse effect, and that's another take-home message. Just because you get an epigenetic change in response to a toxin doesn't mean it is an adverse effect. There are people who are publishing data right now exposing cells, animals to lead, getting this change and saying this is an adverse change. No, we have to put it in context. And I warn people against that. Now, I understand why you're publishing it. I mean, academia, publish or perish, but they're scary. There's a lot of data out there. If you want my opinion, and this is just my opinion, First of all, epigenetic changes in rats do not translate to humans. As a result, just in the case study I gave you, you can't use an epigenetic change in a rat to assess the risk of bromate in humans. Um, and again, if somebody, my big worry is that somebody's going to read this paper and they're going to be doing risk assessment and say, whoa, we get this change at this level, maybe we should change the point of departure or start looking at this. I mean, I don't want my data to be used like that. That's scary because I don't think it does that. And that's one of the takeaways that we here have here. With that, I'm going to close up shop. There's a number of people that worked on this, including Dr. Snyder. And a lot of this was actually funded by the American Water Works Association. Thank you for your time. <laughs>